Hello, this is Eva Amson, welcoming you to this Bite Size Bio webinar, which today is sponsored by Molecular Machines and Industries. Molecular Machines and Industries, or MMI, is the leading provider of microscopic single cell isolation tools. They specialize in single cell separation, laser microdissection, and optical tweezers for a wide range of clinical and research based applications in life sciences, material sciences, and healthcare. Today's presentation is titled The Good, the Bad and the RNA Hunting for Molecular Similarities in Interstitial Lung Diseases and it's being presented by Dr. Lavinia Neubert from Hanover Medical School. Lavinia is a medical doctor and head of the Lung Working Group at the Institute of Pathology at Hanover Medical School, Europe's largest transplantation centre. Since 2013, every freshly explanted lung or heart has been analysed by the Lung Working Group. Lavinia is a specialist in the area of translational research on non-neoplastic lung disease, specifically in interstitial lung disease. As always, we will have a question and answer session after the presentation, so please type any questions you have into the questions box, which appears on the top right panel of your screen, and I'll put them to Lavinia at the end. Details of how to access the on-demand recording of this webinar will be sent to you by email shortly. So now over to you, Lavinia, for the presentation. Hello to everyone and welcome to today's session. I am Lavinia Neubert, a pathologist from Hanover Medical School in Germany, and I'm delighted to have you join me in this webinar, and I hope we will spend a great time within the next minutes. I'm looking forward to your questions at the end of my presentation. Let me start with a quotation of the founder of modern pathology, Rudolf Virchow. Cellular pathology is not an end if one cannot see any alteration in the cell. Chemistry brings the clarification of living processes nearer than does anatomy. Each anatomical change must have been preceded by a chemical one. In accordance to Virchow, I want to take you now on a molecular autopsy of interstitial lung diseases. Non-neoplastic lung diseases such as COPD and interstitial lung diseases rank second among the causes of death and appear as a growing challenge. They are characterized by irreversible remodeling with a relentless loss of lung function and a five-year survival rate over only 30%. There is no medication cure and development of new antifibrotic drugs like nintedanib or pefinidone only slows disease progression. Finally, lung transplantation remains the ultima ratio. However, available grafts are limited, the treatment costs are high and the 5-year survival rate after transplantation barely surpasses 50%. Therefore, novel approaches to understand, prevent and ultimately cure non-neoplastic lung diseases are urgently needed. Our mission is to investigate interstitial lung diseases and enhance our understanding of molecular pathology to improve diagnosis. Our vision is to comprehend the fundamental mechanisms of interstitial lung diseases, create novel diagnostic and therapeutic techniques, and finally implement these discoveries in daily clinical practice. But how do we get there? Hopefully by the end of this webinar, you'll have a better understanding of how RNA can help us to understand the underlying molecular pathophysiology of interstitial lung diseases. you learn applications of advanced instruments for laser microdissection, gain new insights from laser microdissection, mRNA and protein expression analysis, and finally understand the role of fibroblastic foci in fibrotic pulmonary diseases. Confucius once said, success depends upon previous preparation and without such preparation, there is sure to be failure. So next, 
I want to share with you some of the problems we were having and how we solved them. When tissue is the issue and compartment specific analysis. So, which biomaterial is available for my plant experiments? As you may know, human disease is complex and ill understood. Common research strategies rely on animal models or cell culture experiments. The crux is, animal models are complex but not human and cell culture experiments use human cells without complexity of the tissue. It quickly became clear to us that we need the real conditions to study human disease and that there is no way around using tissue from lung transplanted patients. For those of you who are not familiar with lung transplantation, I want to give a brief overview. Lung transplantation often remains as ultima ratio in end-stage lung diseases, like as I already mentioned fibrosing lung diseases. There is the possibility for different surgical approaches like single lung transplantation, double lung transplantation and less frequently used combined lung and heart transplantation. Since the 1980s, Lung transplantation has evolved from an experimental technique to an established treatment option for end-stage lung diseases. This progress has been made possible primarily by improved surgical techniques and organ preservation, more precise selection criteria and refined diagnostics, prophylaxis and treatment of rejection reactions and infections. Since 2012, my mentor Professor Danny Jonik and I built up, in close cooperation with the clinicians, a unique infrastructure at the German largest transplantation center in Hanover. We provide a unique research strategy with a 24-7 human tissue workup and provide high quality and safe biomaterial of human lung and heart explants and gained over 10 years of experience by now. This includes the collection and processing of fresh organ tissue with disease-appropriate workup and diagnostics of human and animal samples according to current gold standards, followed by an integrative scientific use of all available samples. We started with the workup of human lung explants and here on the slide you can see the number of biobanked lung explants over the last decade subdivided into the underlying diseases which led to the indication for lung transplantation. Since then we expand our spectrum to fresh lung resectates and within the cave 0311 also fresh heart explants and cardiac tissue after ventricular assist device implantation. This unique biomaterial of around about 900 patient specimens per year allows us to study the real diseases in their complex human environment and furthermore complements other animal research models. For about 15 years by now we use laser microdissection for compartment analyzers and since then optimized protocols to ensure highest sample integrity for meaningful downstream applications. Your benefits from the MMI cell cut system include flexible microdissection of almost any type of sample, even living cells, the visual inspection of your cutting efficiency and highly specific and meaningful RNA isolates. Now I want to share a short video of our established SOPs in our lab because I think this might help those of you who want to start with their own experiments with lung tissue or any other kind of tissue type. We use standard formalin fixed paraffin embedded lung tissue blocks and all steps were performed under prevention of contaminations. Sections of approximately 10 micrometer thickness are cut and afterwards placed on special RNA-free membrane slides provided by NMI.
Afterwards, sections were uncoated from paraffin using saloon, followed by a detailing alcohol fluids in water for 10 minutes each. Afterwards, staining for three seconds by dipping the slide in filtered hemalone was performed, and the slides were dried. 30 slides with each two sections were used for laser microdissection from each case to yield about 10,000 cells. Laser microdissection was performed using the MMI filter system. Selection and encycling of fibroblastic foci was conducted using the MMI cell tool software. Finally, encycled regions were laser cut and this round in a sterile way using MMI isolation cuts. All samples from one patient were pooled in one tube, taken together. We are able to use unique biomaterial to study the real disease in its complex human environment. By using the MMI cell cut system with its unique low damage UV laser, we are able to specifically excise and analyze different compartments of the lung and establish a protocol to yield high quality RNA for further downstream analysis. Let me now switch to the second part of this presentation, novel insights into pulmonary fibrogenesis and our study of the compartment specific and comparative analysis of fibroblastic foci in IPF, UIP and pulmonary sarcoidosis. As you may know, fibroblastic foci are characteristic histopathological features of UAP, which is the typical histological damage pattern of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, in addition to presence of lung architecture disorder, bronchialization of the peripheral airways, and myogenic metaplasia. They usually occur in the early stages of, of pulmonary fibrosis and are associated with disease genesis, disease progression, and poor prognosis with a median transplant-free survival of approximately three years. According to current guidelines of the American Thoracic Society and European Respiratory Society, fibroblastic foci are among the most important histopathological criteria for the diagnosis of UIP IPF and their presence alone leads to at least a probable UIP pattern. The definition of fibroblastic foci, however, even in the recently updated ATS guidelines of May 2022, remains rather poor and controversial. The guidelines say that fibroblastic foci consists of localized proliferating myofibroblasts with cuboidal epithelial lining. And given addition of, currently there is no universally accepted definition of fibroblastic foci and that similar lesions are observed in a large number of fibrotic lung diseases. We also notice that there is not much known about the underlying molecular similarities and differences of fibroblastic foci in various disease entities. Therefore, we are focusing on molecular pathology as an addendum for diagnostics and better understanding. In a systematic re-evaluation, of all processed lung expands from end-stage diseases in Hanover with regard to the number and distribution pattern of fibroblastic foci, we found as expected a high prevalence of fibroblastic foci in IPF lungs, but surprisingly also in sarcoidosis lung. Based on the comparable histomorphology, we hypothesized that there might be a related molecular background of fibroblastic foci in variant fibrosing lung diseases. Therefore, we selected six clinically well-characterized samples of each of these two entities per group for the compartment-specific analysis of fibroblastic foci. We used healthy lung tissue from so-called downsizing lung as control samples.
Isolation of fibroblastic foci from lung tissue of IPF and sarcoidosis samples was performed by laser microdissection with consecutive mRNA and protein expression analysis. For this purpose, we used the commercially available fibrosis panel with 760 fibrosis associated genes from nanostring and classical immunohistochemistry. The mRNA expression analysis revealed a significantly altered expression signature for 375 of 760 genes compared with the controls presented. Of these, 264 showed similar regulation of fibroblastic foci from both disease entities. After hormone ferroni correction, 136 genes still showed significantly altered expression compared with controls, of which 69 showed similar expression. With respect to the FDR-based expression data, only two of the differentially regulated genes ultimately remained. Immunostaining of selected markers from each group confirmed these results. Taken together, our results suggest the molecular similarity of fibroblastic foci in sarcoidosis and IPF. As we have shown in previous work for bronchiolitis obliterans and alveolar fibroelastosis, Fibroblastic foci are also a general pattern of damage whose pathogenic mechanisms are independent of the underlying disease and rely on the same molecular processes. Given the occurrence of fibroblastic foci and other fibrotic lung diseases, the impact of their presence on diagnosis should be re-evaluated in current guidelines. Likewise, the applicability of antifibrotic agents Approved for IPF, such as nintedanib or perfinidone, as a new therapeutic option for sarcoidosis should be evaluated in further studies. Our journey together has come to an end, and I would like to thank you very much for your attention. If you are interested in further information, I would like to refer to our manuscript and the application note of MMI. I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you, Lavinia. That was an excellent presentation. And we're now also joined by Dani Jonik and Mark Kuhler for the Q&A. Um, before we start with the questions, there's also one more poll question for everyone. So this question is, would you like us to provide you with additional information about the MMI cell cut? So while you all answer that, we can start with the first Q&A question. Um, we've got a few questions in already, but if anyone else has a question, you can put that in the questions box that's on the top right of your screen. So the first question, um, how long does it take to generate one sample of RNA and where are the limitations? Hi, can everybody hear me? Yes. <laughs> Great. So before I answer the question, uh, I hope you enjoyed the webinar and I would like to apologize for falling back to pre-recording due to my hoarseness, as you hear or you may hear. And uh, at this uh, point, I would also like to thank MMI for giving us the opportunity to present our project to this great audience today. And now I want to answer your first question, Eva. Um, you ask how long does it take to generate one sample of RNA and where are the limitations of this? So uh, it usually takes up uh, to three days to laser enough material from just one compartment of one sample. Right. So as already shown in the video, we try to laser microdissect approximately 30 slides 
are two sections. And um, for time management, it takes us half an hour to cycle in all the compartments. And uh, we can um, sign in three slides um, in one time. And uh, then uh, the laser takes one to two hours to micro dissect um, all the compartments from these three slides. And so we can estimate that we need three days for one sample. And our limitations is that we often have a small number of um, obtained cells. So it could be that we even need more material and even more slides, and then it would take even longer to isolate mm. the cells. But that's not the problem because um, at the end of the day, we can freeze our material at minus 20, 20 degrees. And when we finished uh, the LISA micro dissection, we can pool all samples together and uh, can isolate a high amount of RNA. And for further analysis, we need up to 100 nanogram of RNA. Okay, <clears throat> thanks. Um, I'll give you a little break for your voice. <laughs> so <laughs> next question, um, I'll let either Mark or Danny answer it. Um, which methods can be combined with laser micro dissection? Ha. Mark, may I? Or Okay. Um, I actually, like 25 years ago, <laughs> I started doing my, my PhD thesis on um, kidney transplantation, actually. It was long before uh, Lavinia and Mark and I joined forces. And um, just to sort of uh, do a spin back on what La Lavinia just delineated, like it takes a couple of days to do one sample. At that time, it took me with the, not your machine, but you know, with the, the machine I was using at the time, which was really proficient at that moment, it took me like one and a half weeks to do one sample. And like uh, three out of four amplification attempts did not work. So we came a long way. And um, I mean, the beauty of laser micro dissection is that you have just that, the compartment in which you're interested. And we always combine extracting the target lesion with a compartment specific analysis using EG, spatial transcriptomic, spatial profiling, um, advanced like multi-channel immunistic chemistry, and obviously uh, either digital or conventional histopathological assessment. Do as much as you can in order to assess your lesion in context of the environment. Um, but of course, laser micro dissection still has the beauty that you can be really, really sure when you do it right that you are use my phone as an example for a fibroblastic focus, you can cut that out and everything else is not in your well. And that makes it so pure and still so, so simple, but yet such a beautiful concept. And I would always combine assessing um, the target lesion in its ideally three-dimensional microenvironment with actually cutting that out because that sort of makes your results in regard to, let's say, uh, sequencing, gene expression analysis, protein expression, whatever, extremely bomb proof as it were in regard to reviews like when we did both i i like guys correct me but i don't think we ever had um, a reviewer being extremely critical when we have put forward both approaches mm. thanks thanks for that it's Welcome. interesting to hear a bit about how you use things as well um in the meantime, um, one of the questions that came in is just asking, this is, I, I think you did mention it, but what's the equipment that you used for the paraffin tissue samples testing? Mark? <laughs> um, yeah, for uh, gene expression analysis, for example, we like to use uh, the nanostring system. Um, in the past, we used microarrays. Um, uh, or single PCR, for example. So basically, uh, yeah, we've come the whole evolution of techniques uh, so far. And let's put it like this, the um, the quality of the data and the, let's say, the precision um, that connects the gene expression really to the histological correlates of disease 
is uh, or was getting better and better um, when we started to, to isolate really compartment specific using la laser micro dissection and we're able to nail down the differences as Lavinia showed so nicely in the presentation uh, of the interstitial pulmonary uh, fibrotic disease. Thanks. Um, this is a question for Lavinia based on the talk you showed. Um, it says, I notice you only use hematoxylin to stain your sections. Have you tested the impact of eosin stain? And do you have to do a RIN score on tissue before assessing RNA quality? Okay. Hi, Jeremy. It's your <laughs> question. Um, yes, uh, we also uh, we just use filtered hemolown because if you use the eosin component in the staining, um, you can get RNA damage. And uh, we have the experience that the RNA, RNA quality is even better if you just use um, filtered him alone. And of course, uh, we look at the RNA quality. Uh, we use a um, qubit system. And um, yeah, for isolation of RNA, it's really easy. We take the key again, um, RNA uh, easy FFPE isolation kit and following the manufacturer's uh, protocol. Thanks. Um, and this is a question for whoever wants to take it. How many cells are needed for sufficient RNA quality? I can take it if it's okay for the other. <laughs> yeah, there's a sump rule. We take about approximately 10,000 cells. Um, there's a possibility to have the visual control. If you use the cap and uh, look at the tubelet, you can see if there's a smooth floor of uh, cells and then it's okay. But also in the software of MMI, there's a possibility to see how many um, square millimeters you already laser micro dissected. And so you can, um, uh, yeah, you can see if uh, there are difference between the um, different patient samples. Okay. Yeah. If I just, sorry, if I, if I just may, um, um, <laughs> just, uh, and, like I know where obviously uh, the person asking is coming from, right? And um, we have all been there, like, isn't this like enough? I'm sure it is enough. I've been at this for two and a half days and it surely is enough now. I, can, I have to warn against that because especially when you're talking routine diagnostics, formalin fixed paraffin embedded tissue, there might be autolysis in there, which you don't see, right? So if push comes to shelf, the, the root of thumb is more. <laughs> yeah, seriously, because you don't want to be that gal or that guy who did like, okay, it's 10,500 is good enough. And then you, then you shake it up, you get the nucleate assets out and then no peaks in amplification or no peaks in nanostring readout, whatever, and just do another third more because we've all been there and you'll be more upset if you don't do an additional laser assisted um, isolation as compared to when you do, when you give it another half a day, um, you know, have a coffee, come back and then do some more, like root of thumb is do more. <laughs> yeah, so it sounds like there isn't really a fixed number. It's more based on like experience, what it looks like and get as much as possible. <laughs> um, how do you continue based on the knowledge you gained? Uh, Lavinia, do you want to take yeah. that? No problem. So there are many uh, possibilities how we can continue. First of all, um, I think uh, it would be best um, to to test the applicability of antifibrotic drugs in uh, pulmonary sarcoidosis patients. And how do we get this? Um, we have the possibility to perform precision cut lung slices, as you may know, or you, you've never heard of them before. It's a possibility to cut our fresh uh, lung tissue and to take uh, the tissue into culture. And then you can apply um, any drug you want and you can see what happens with the tissue. So this would be the first possibility we can do and um, we can compare it to the patients uh, with the um, IPF. Furthermore, um, 
our working group would like to look at the proteomics in fibroblastic foci. And there we also have a beginning collaboration pro project in America with Jeremy Herrera. And um, finally, we are trying at the moment to gain impact on the ATS guidelines uh, by next publishing a manuscript with the re-evaluation of the fibroblastic foci in end-stage lung diseases. Great, thanks. <laughs> Lots of work coming up still. <laughs> Um, so the last question I have is a bit more philosophical. So whoever wants to take this, um, in this new era of spatial transcriptomics, does this make laser micro dissection obsolete? Pick me. Okay, Danny, what's your opinion? <laughs> Abs absolutely not. I mean, the, the, the thing is when we started using laser assisted micro dissection, it was still the hottest kit on the block, right? Mm -hmm. And now they have other kits, uh, kits sort of come out to play. But at the end of the day, when you have one technique and you think that's like the golden key to everything, most likely it's not true. <laughs> so um, laser micro dissection still is a very central part in what we're doing. And as I said, when you really want to make your results bomb proof, use more than one approach. And um, ideally, I mean, it's, Lavinia surely records that when Lavinia started out doing laser micro dissection, she had two microscopes there, the one for doing the laser assisted micro dissection and the conventional little one in which you actually looked at regular H and E routine diagnostic slides. And you would go this way and that way and this way and that way, like make sure what you're getting into your well, right? So ideally do the conventional histopathology or perhaps dis dis digital pathology, whatever, before you even decide what you're going to cut do a comprehensive analysis and actually have somebody else perhaps look at it before you actually cut into the tissue. Do spatial transcriptomics if you can, do laser assisted micro dissection and do conventional immunistic chemistry. All these techniques are fish, all these techniques still have their place. And as a sum, they really still yield fantastic results. And I mean, Lavinia was being too modest on her manuscript, right? Because when we are talking fibroblastic fossa, when you look into the ATS guidelines or the German S2K guidelines, um, when you have like interstitial lung disease with fibroblastic foci present, people say, yeah, it's, it's, you're like two thirds down the voyage in regard to a UIP pattern IPF. And that, that's sort of a disease with a median survival of three and a half years, if untreated, four years if treated. I mean, that's worse than metastasized colon cancer. So by doing what Lavinia did, what we did, um, we actually could show by laser micro dissection, not by spatial profiling, we could actually show that, nope, it's a general injury pattern as we always predicted. And, um, you know, there, there, you shouldn't overemphasize that lesion. It's important, but it's not really um, that particular. So, and that was done purely by laser micro dissection as the leading technique, right? So um, I think that question sort of answered itself. Okay. Yeah, sorry. I just wanted to add that yeah. uh, on top of it, spatial transcriptomics is of course very nice, but, but it is also extremely expensive. Mm -hmm. um, and laser micro dissection basically allows to use the techniques that are already established in the labs and with almost zero investment, uh, if you have access to a laser micro dissection system, you can get your material in a compart uh, compartment specific way and analyze it. And that's a huge benefit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I just want to add, the best thing would be to combine laser micro dissection with spatial transcriptomics. And I'm not from MMI, but maybe there is uh, something in preparation uh, <laughs> to combine these um, two methods. Would be great. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for all weighing in on that. Um... I think that takes us to the end of the questions and the end of the webinar. So thank you again, Lavinia, for a great presentation. And thanks to Mark and Danny for joining us for a discussion. And thanks to the sponsor, Molecular Machines and Industries. And of course, thanks to the audience for taking the time to attend and listen in. So until next time, good luck in your research and goodbye from all of us at Molecular Machines and Industries and Bite Size Bio. Thank <laughs> you.